Hello everyone, my name is Devashish and I welcome you all to this video. So in today's video, we are going to talk about some OS internal concepts and to be precise, I'll be talking about the concept of virtual memory. So if you're planning to appear in, you know, and interviews that are focused on reverse engineering malware analysis, uh, you should actually face a lot of questions related to OS internals. So I thought maybe I should, you know, start a new video series where I'll be, I'll be explaining uh, different OS internal concepts that is required for, you know, uh, if you are actually getting started with reverse engineering and virtual memory is one of the things that is very crucial uh, when it comes to re reverse engineering so I thought maybe I'll create a very short video uh, where I'll explain you know uh, different concepts that are essential for you know a reverse engineers to learn so without wasting any further time let's get started so now let's imagine you have a computer a 32-bit computer and this particular computer has some physical memory let's say 4 gigs so if you open process explorer in this particular system you will get to see a lot of processes are running so this pro running processes will be utilizing some part of this physical memory to run now here comes the concept of virtual memory so the operating system actually creates a emulation to this all these processes which makes them feel like you know each of this process is having access to this entire 4 GB of physical memory so that memory is known as virtual memory so if I have to explain again so this chrome.exe when it is running it will feel like that it has access to this entire 4 GB memory space this chrome.exe uh, this snap camera.exe if we take it will also have a separate 4 GB of you know memory space to run so this concept is known as virtual memory now now let's say this is the virtual memory map for chrome.exe and as i have already said this is a 32-bit system so the size of this virtual memory will be 2 to the power 32 minus 1 which is comes around 4 gb so this is 4 GB of virtual memory for this chrome.exe now the operating system will divide this particular virtual memory into two parts the let's say this is starting from 0 and this is separated like this is like this. and this is the end of this virtual memory now half of this uh, 4 gigabytes of uh, virtual memory is known as uh, user land and the next half is known as kernel land so all these processes that you see uh, in process explorer mostly are running in user mode which is no is which is this user land now what all things are kept here and what all things are kept here so in user land there are very critical components that are loaded the first thing that is loaded is uh, the main binary of chrome.exe whenever actually you are double clicking into any exe so it will be the entire image the chrome.exe image will be loaded into the user land and after that the all the dependencies like all the dls that is required to run chrome.exe will be loaded here so all these things this exe files dll files are loaded here and to import important data structure that also uh, you know present in the user land those are actually you know stack and heap so stack heap so when you allocate memory in stack it will grow in this direction and when you allocate memory in heap it will go in this direction so you have to always remember stack always grows downward so when where the zero is it will grow towards this point and heap will grow towards this point so the reason stack and heap are allocated in this way so that it can efficiently reuse the same memory uh, same virtual memory uh, to allocate uh, chunks so now what all things are kept in kernel land so in kernel land the main operating system kernel is loaded uh, for you know for windows system it is usually ntoskrnl.exe that main kernel image is loaded and all the device driver that you see uh, this uh, the sys files right all the sys files are loaded here so now 
So when you have to debug any user mode process, you need user mode debugger. And when you have to debug any stuffs that is running here, you need actually a kernel debugger. So uh, you might have already aware. Uh, so actually WinDBG provides, you know, two different debuggers. One is, you know, this user mode debugger, which actually, you know, uh, allows you to manipulate this section of this virtual memory. And when you are actually debugging kernel, uh, this it actually allows you to uh, manipulate this section of memory. Uh, so now when any process is running uh, at the end of the day it has to you know uh, communicate with the actual hardware right so it has to the call has to grow from user land to kernel land to the actual hardware so how does it uh, how the call transition happens so uh, uh, the user land actually communicate with the kernel land with help of system calls so now let's understand how does system call happen on windows platform so imagine this chrome.exe maybe it is you know load sorry it's this chrome.exe exe which is loaded here uh, wants to write a file to disk okay so the call transition has to happen from user land to kernel land and then it will finally write things to disk how does it happen how does you know it jumps this portion so as we said it actually uses system call so how does it happen so chrome.exe will um, utilize the api called create file create file which is actually exported from kernel 32.dll now the create file call actually uh, the create file API will call another API which is known as NT create file which is exported from ntdll.dll which is, uh, is also loaded in loaded in user mode memory itself kernel 32 and ntdll both are loaded in user land memory now this uh, NT uh, DLL or you know this NT create file API will actually you know invoke the system call which is using a instruction called ccenter. So this is how the ccenter instruction actually executes. So, so what this does is so basically it copies all the argument that are you know that were passed to create file API from user land stack to kernel mode stack. So and stack to kernel mode stack mode stack because that is also necessary here so that's why those arguments are copied from user mode to kernel mode and after that if you look at look here a special code is moved to register ex so what is the special code so this is actually an entry in ssdt table so if you want me to make a separate video on SSDT table, how this table actually works, uh, let me know in the comment section, I'll create a separate video. So now, since we are actually calling create file, uh, so it will look for this NT create file entry in SSDT table. And there is a actually mapping. So for NT create file, there is this code is for 25. So that's why it moves this particular code 25 to EX register. And after that, it executes ccenter. Uh, after this instruction is executed, the actually call the, the transition happens from user led to kernel land. So after that, after it, if you have to debug anything, you need a kernel mode debugger. You cannot debug it using a user mode debugger. So till this point, you'll be able to see everything in, in a user mode debugger. So since it's happening in user mode, but after that, you have to attach a kernel mode debugger to your operating system to see what all things are happening in kernel mode. So that's all I wanted to discuss in today's video. Uh, as you can see, this is my first uh, whiteboard video. And uh, if you want me to make more such videos, please let me know in the comment section and don't forget to hit the like button. Uh, and if you have any specific topic in your mind that you want me to, you know, cover in the upcoming videos uh, please let me know in the comment section as well so thank you for your time i hope you have enjoyed have a great day bye bye